October 1st is recognized by some churches as World Communion Sunday. So instead of preaching one of the assigned passages for the day, I thought I might use this sermon to focus on communion itself and what it means for Christians around the world. So here's a sermon called A Table with 7,417,622,501 Seats. A lot of important things in life happen around the table, don't they? We celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, and graduations around tables of food and fellowship. We have family reunions, social gatherings, and church outings all around tables full of good food. Some people make marriage proposals at tables. Others make significant decisions about their lives around a table. Growing up, the family table was a special place at my house. It still is today for our kids and our grandchildren. The following took place around a very special table. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood and the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The world population is always a moving target. So when I wrote this sermon, it was at 7,417,000,000 622,501, and it's growing as we speak. And it just strikes me that every one of those people, they all belong to the family of God, all of them. So who are they? Well, for one, they're wonderfully diverse. They speak a multitude of languages and are of various colors. So we know that God is not boring. And many of them have children and some get to be grandparents. They enjoy all kinds of different foods, music, dance, and art. They all struggle in some way or the other. They all get sick from time to time and eventually they all experience death and grief. But they also celebrate and they laugh they cry, they work, they play, they sleep, they eat. We have all that in common. Some of them get spiritually lost and others of them may even be evil, it seems. But most of them, most of them are really good people. All 7,417,622,501 of them, they all matter. And would there be any of them that do not matter? And if so, who would it be who decides that? No, every one of them, every single one of them are children of God. So how do we get so torn and so separated from each other? And the sad thing is this isn't new. History records our racism, discrimination, prejudice, wars, and quest for power, abuse and violence, litter many of our relationships. Some people starve while others throw away food. Some of us sleep in security while others sleep on the streets. We know all too well what divides us. Nation and race, 
gender and social class. We're divided by neighborhoods and schools, political parties, and religion. We're divided even as conservatives and moderates and liberals on social issues like immigration, abortion, sexuality, the economy, foreign affairs, just to name a few. The Richmond Foreign Forum hosted uh, two award-winning American presidential historians, John Meacham and Doris Kearns Goodwin. The moderator was Steve Inskeep of uh, NPR. And part of that discussion was on the things that are currently dividing this nation. And during the question and answer period, someone in the crowd asked, is there anything that unites us? John Meacham made a comment that could have been said in any church, mosque, or synagogue anywhere in the world. It could be said in any house of government or in any school. I'm paraphrasing it, but it was along this line. He said, it's the things we love that unite us, and we love too few things. Hmm. I wonder what it is on this World Communion Sunday that we love, that unites us. Jesus said to love God above all things. And then he tacked on one nobody asked for. He said, and while you're at it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. There are no greater laws than these, he said. You realize that Jews and Muslims and Christians all have those same laws in our Bibles and books? As simplistic as that sounds, love God and love your neighbor. We've seen what the world looks like when we do not abide by these simple laws. It's devastating. It's a world in which none of us want to live. It's a painful, violent, angry, disrespectful, maybe even evil world that is void of the law of love. So what if we were to love, if we were, those of us gathered around this table of Christ, if we were to love all 7,417,622,501 and growing of God's children in this world, would we speak to each other with more respect, do you think? Would we legislate with more sensitivity to the common good? Would we talk less and learn more from each other? Would we live with a greater sense of civility? There's a word. I think it's one thing to disagree with each other. But it's another thing to demonize one another. Do you want to live in that kind of world? Or do you want your grandchildren to live in that kind of world? We do have options. I think that's what this table today says. It doesn't have to be that kind of world. There is one more seat at this table with all these folks. Jesus said he would one day join us to drink the wine of forgiveness and reconciliation in our Father's kingdom. That indeed is a different world. That's a world with different rules, different power, different priorities, and a different purpose. It's a world in which all 7,417,622,501 people absolutely matter. And the wonderful thing is we don't have to wait until we die to get to that world. 
Christ rose from the dead so we could begin to live in that world now. That would be our choice. And this table, this table of Christ, invites us and everybody else into that wonderful world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.